सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली लेट वन समर इवनिंग फाइव इयर्स गो एन एयर कंडीशन एस यू वी पुलडअप आउटसाइड नॉन डिस्क्रिप्ट होम इन द डस ब्लोन आउटस्कर्ट ऑफ बहावलपुर The elderly cleric who emerged from the car had arrived to deliver a eulogy for a laborer's slain son. Teenager Muhammad Yaqub had been buried weeks earlier in southern Kashmir. Luridly coloured pamphlets plastered across the town proclaimed he had been martyred fighting the Indian army while performing ghazwa e Hind, the apocalyptic war prophesied to precede the Day of Judgment. from accounts of similar funerals recorded by the scholar Maryam Abu Zahab we know that Lashkar-e-Taiba second in command Abdul Rahman Makki likely urged Yaqub's family to celebrate not mourn the day after their son was killed one family even gathered his friends for walima to celebrate his shaadi with the huris that's a reception for a wedding with the maidens of paradise earlier this week following months of delay due to chinese objections that very makki was designated a global terrorist by the united nations security council four more important terror commanders though with 2611 operational leader sajid meer lashkar charity chief shahid mahmood the organization's heir apparent talha saeed and jaish e mohammed military chief abdul rauf alwi remain off the global sanctions list because of china's security council veto the message has something to do with geopolitics beijing is letting islamabad know it can count on iron brother to protect it from confrontation with its jihadist clients there is a less obvious story unfolding too facing the resurgence of anti state jihadists like the tehreek e taliban pakistan the pakistan security establishment is again cultivating the lashkar and jaish as loyal proxies for months now there's been evidence that the lashkar's infrastructure remains active with the organization able to mobilize funds and cadre last year's floods saw significant mobilization by the lashkar the jaish e mohammed for its part has been expanding its seminary complex and even held rallies calling for jihad in kashmir founded in 1986 by three religious studies professors at the Lahore University of Engineering the birth of the lashkar was midwifed by Abdullah Yusuf Azam the Palestinian Jordanian ideologue who served as mentor to generations of arab jihadists including Osama bin Laden then known as the Markaz Uddawat Wal Irshad or Center for Proselytization the lashkar built a sprawling campus on land gifted by general mohammad zia ul haq's military regime complete with schools colleges medical facilities and factories the campus was the kernel of general zia's hope to rebuild pakistan as a sharia governed islamic state with the laws of god and jihad as its two guiding principles late in 2018 as it battled to emerge from the financial action task force terrorist financing watch list islamabad began promising to dismantle this jihadist empire the hammer did finally fall but with extraordinary gentleness even though lashkar chief hafiz mohammad saeed was sentenced to 15 years in prison in 2020 he was moved to house arrest within weeks of his conviction that year makki's own sentence was suspended by the lahore high court The trials of important 2611 perpetrators like Sajid Meer moreover were shrouded in secrecy. The United States publicly noted that Pakistan's judicial system had often released convicted terrorists, a fact that fueled concern about what Islamabad would do once the threat of sanctions was finally removed. Last summer New Delhi moved to have five key jihadists added to the global list maintained by the United Nations. listing these terrorists the argument went would make it that much more difficult for pakistan to release the jihadists it had convicted under the threat of sanctions efforts to designate the five though ran into a diplomatic wall put up by china 
Even though Kashmir police records suggest Makki had no significant military role in the Lashkar, family ties qualified him as a trustworthy custodian of the empire when Saeed was in jail. A cousin of Saeed and also his brother-in-law through marriage to two sisters, Makki was given charge of the Lashkar's international relationships, expert C. Christine Fair has written. That gave Makki links to financiers across West Asia and in Pakistan's global diaspora. Fighters in the organization, moreover, respected Makki as an ideologue. Political scientist Stephen Tankill has noted that Makki played a key role in crafting theological justifications for the Lashkar's suicide squad operations. The testimony of 2611 perpetrator David Headley to the National Investigation Agency shows that Makki regularly lectured at jihadist gatherings in Lahore together with Saeed. Makki, the UN now notes, was a key figure in, and I quote, raising funds, recruiting and radicalizing youth to violence and planning attacks. Following 2611, with Saeed under growing international pressure, Makki continued to speak for the organization and played a key role in efforts by the Lashkar to emerge at the head of an Islamist political coalition called the Difai Pakistan Council. The Lashkar second-in-command made clear his opposition to former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's efforts to normalize the relationship with India. If India is not our enemy, Makki wrote in 2017, then why do we need a nuclear bomb? India is our enemy and the enmity is due to the Kashmir issue. Talha, Saeed's son, had been groomed to succeed his elderly father, but with few real jihadist credentials, he was less than credible to the Lashkar's rank and file. With the father in jail, it was vital for Makki to remain free to secure the succession. Abdul Rauf Alvi, brother to the seriously ill Jaish chief Masood Azhar Alvi, was also handed a similar role in that organization. Like all dinners, the heirs to the Lashkar and Jaish will control empires built over decades. The Lashkar's Aldawa school network, notably, continues to operate, though under the notional administration of the government. Tankel has noted that the organization's education wing was once its most profitable and powerful department. First set up in 1994, the organization's Aldawa system was claimed to be operating 127 schools with 15,000 students and 800 teachers and offering subsidized tuitions to the poor. Textbooks published by the organization expert Mohammad Amir Rana has recorded modified standard information, you know, like C is for cat and G is for goat, became C is for cannon and G is for gun. The teachers at these institutions were required to have received jihadist military instruction. The jaish e Muhammad likewise continues to publish jihadist literature for children, which is taught to students at its network of seminaries. Institutions like the Al-Dawa Medical Missions, initially set up to care for jihadists injured in Kashmir, have spawned elaborate networks that provide the Lashkar with reach and influence among Pakistan's poorest. Following a ban imposed on jihadist charity networks in 2018, journalists Asif Shahzad and Mubashir Bukhari reported, I quote, a few government representatives were on site and new signs hung to rename the facilities, but little else appeared to have changed. For generations of generals who've helmed Pakistan's national security, state-sanctioned jihadism has seemed a useful tool and not just to trouble India. Lashkar membership, Abu Zahab has perceptively noted, serves as a safety valve for surplus manpower. Joining a jihadi movement, she writes, gives young boys who cannot afford to migrate to the West or the Gulf and are socially frustrated a substitute identity and compensates for their frustrations. The financial incentives to join groups like the Lashkar or Jaish, the scholar noted, are not insignificant. Being a martyr is... In addition, an opportunity for lower-class boys to become famous. Ever since 2001, when General Parvez Musharraf's break with the jihadist movement pushed thousands towards anti-regime organizations like the TTP and Al-Qaeda, the rationale for maintaining loyal, subservient proxies like the Jaish and Lashkar has seemed even more compelling. Four times though, terrorism has almost led Pakistan into a war its generals know the country can neither afford economically nor militarily. The crisis of 2001, 2002, 2611, 2016, 2019 were all outcomes of terrorist strikes that had consequences 
far larger than what the generals had anticipated. A fifth crisis could well lie ahead, with Pakistan seemingly determined not to turn off the lights in the public sector jihad factory founded by General Zia. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm National Security Editor of The Print. Thank you again for listening to Security Code.